Our opening hymn is number 558, Come Christians, Join to Sing. for us. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. May Almighty God have mercy on us, forgive us our sins, and bring us to everlasting life. Amen. Amen. Spirit, 
God forever and ever. Amen. A reading from the book of Job. Job spoke, saying, Is not man's life on earth a drudgery? Are not his days those of hirelings? He is a slave who longs for the shade, a hireling who waits for his wages. So I have been assigned months of misery, and troubled nights have been allotted to me. If in bed when I say, when shall I arise? Then the night drags on. I am filled with restlessness until the dawn. My days are swifter than a weaver's shuttle. They come to an end without hope. Remember that my life is like the wind. I shall not see happiness again. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God.
Gospel according to Mark. On leaving the synagogue, Jesus entered the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. Simon's mother-in-law lay sick with a fever. They immediately told him about her. He approached, grasped her hand, and helped her up. Then the fever left her, and she waited on them. When it was evening, after sunset, they brought to him all who were ill or possessed by demons. The whole town was gathered at the door. He cured many who were sick with various diseases and drove out many demons, not permitting them to speak because they knew him. Rising very early before dawn, he left and went off to a deserted place where he prayed. Simon and those who were with him pursued him, and on finding him said, Everyone is looking for you. He told them, Let's go on to the nearby villages that I may preach there also. For this purpose I have come. So they went into their synagogues, preaching and driving out demons throughout the whole of Galilee. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. My brothers and sisters, uh, in about a few months, I will be celebrating 16 years a priest. And I have to tell you that last night, I had something happen to me that I am still processing. It was a grace and something very profound. So yesterday afternoon, we received a phone call here at our Lady Health of Christians requesting that somebody in, in the Wellington area uh, receive the sacrament of anointing of the sick, someone who had just entered into hospice care. And uh, just so happened that Father Trask next door at St. Patrick's is out of town. So, you know, when that happens, when we're out of town, we help each other out. And so last evening after uh, Mass, after Adoration, uh, we have on First Friday evenings, I went over. Um, and perform the anointing of the sick and help prepare this gentleman to enter into the final stages of his life. It, and it's something, I mean, it's something, honestly, in almost 16 years of ministry that I've done probably hundreds of times. And yet, in the midst of celebrating the sacrament of the anointing of the sick, when we got to the Our Father, it just kind of like out of nowhere, because he was sitting on the couch in the living room, and I was sitting next to him, and uh, as we were about to enter into our Father, he said, Father, hold my hand. And without even my ability for like a second to reach over, to grasp his hand, he grabbed mine. And it was one of those moments where I couldn't help but think of our gospel today when Jesus took the hand of Simon's mother-in-law and cured her. It was an experience that... I don't even know if I have the words to express it. Because as a priest, we're ordained to go out and to be an altar priestess, another Christ. And so you go out to minister, and in some way it was like Christ was also reaching out to me in that moment. And so I'm still processing the profound nature of that interaction, how it aligns so well with our gospel today. Of course, I know for this gentleman that I anointed last night that his journey in this world is coming to an end. And I know that I was not going to heal him of his infirmities, but he did remark after we were done how he felt lighter in soul and spirit, ready and prepared. But it also addressed the question that perhaps I have been I've been wrestling with this entire week, and that is, what does Jesus feel like? What does Jesus feel like? Now you might say to me, Father Ed, that seems like a very odd question. And quite frankly, I don't know if I've ever been asked that question in my life, and you probably haven't. 
But as I was alluding to the past couple weeks in my homilies, I've been kind of stringing things along, and one of the things I've been focusing on on the past couple of weeks that you've heard is zeroing in or dialing in on the voice of Jesus Christ, asking, what does Jesus, what does the voice of Jesus, what does that sound like? Can you recognize his voice? Can you recognize the voice of God the Father above all other voices, above all other noises in this world? Because we know that there are so many things in our world that vie for our attention. And so if we do not know that voice, how other voices may lead us astray. And we also know the power of Jesus' voice, the power that calls us to follow him, the power that conquers demons that drives out demons. And I want to be very clear that in the scriptures, when we're talking about demons, we are talking about things of Satan. When we hear unclean spirits, it's not addressing the, the average sin that maybe you and I struggle with. But actually, in the original Greek text, it alludes to things that are not of God, not of our humanity, that are truly demonic. And so we've been hearing about the power of one who calls us to follow him and has the power to heal by word alone. And yet this week, what we see in Jesus and his interaction with uh, Simon's mother-in-law is that he reaches out and touches her. And in doing so, heals her. And at the risk of being cliche, it's almost like that old AT&T commercial, right? Reach out and touch someone. And yes, I'm old enough to know that commercial. <laughs> but what does that tell us? What does that invite us to encounter? And I think that comes back to the question of what does Jesus feel like? Even though it might be an odd question, we see that as Jesus reaches out to Simon's mother-in-law, that in doing so, he acknowledges that not only does God want to free us in spirit, but in body as well. That he wants us to know him down to the very fabric of our very being, of who we are. They came not to heal just our spirit or to think that he wants us spiritually free, but also to heal us and, feel, and, and free us physically. That he wants to be close to us not only in spirit, but in body, in the fullness of who we are, because we remember as human beings that unlike other created things, other, like, other than like the angels and other things, that we are both spirit and body. That's what human being is, spirit and body together. And so it highlights how Jesus desires to go out and to touch, and how touch is so important and transformative in healing. The healing of the blind man, other healings of scripture, that Jesus reaches out and touches and the healing power that comes from that. And so in that alone, we are called then to, if that is God's desire for us, if the, in the union that God desires between you and me and wants us to know and wants us to live and wants to remind us of how he wants to live in relationship with us, then it does again beg that question for us to understand and to know and to experience and reflect about, like, what does Jesus feel like? What does Jesus feel like? Perhaps that's why we're here, and we're part of this living body of Christ. Because it is in the life of the church that we see how Jesus is reminding us what he feels like. As he reaches out to us, first and foremost, there's sacraments of the church. If you think about all the sacraments of the church, whether it be baptism, whether it be anointing of the sick, whether it be confirmation, even our vocations, whether it be to the religious life, to priesthood, to uh, the, or the married life, baptism. In all these sacraments, we see how, whether it be through water, through oil, through the prayer of blessing, the laying on of hands, that God is reaching out and touching us. And even more so, in the summit and source of our life, that when we receive Jesus Christ into our very beings again, how He is reaching out and touching us, desiring to be one with us, not in, only in spirit but our physical reality, in our bodies, in the very fabric of who we are. 
It's also important for us to know what does Jesus feel like? And he gives us a loving community and these sacraments to reach out to one another. Because when we say feel, sometimes we only think about the touch aspect. But also, it exudes or it reminds us of what it feels like to be long. Because the sacraments highlight one of the aspects of our prayer, our public prayer in the church. And, and as we celebrate the sacraments of the church, Jesus reminds us of the community that we are part of. And how he's reaching out and touching us. And I don't know if you've ever received the sacrament of the anointing of the sick. Or if someone has come to visit you uh, with the Eucharist when you are ill. Or if you are a Eucharistic minister and have that opportuni opportunity to do that. But again, Jesus. What does Jesus feel like? <clears throat> reaching out. Touching. Reminding us that we, the, of the communion he desires. The healing he desires. The wholeness he desires between <clears throat> us and him. Also, another way to think about it is it goes down to the very way, the very way in which we have also been created. In our CIA this past week, or sometimes we now refer to it as OCIA, but in any case, um, we were breaking open the scriptures, and somebody asked, you know, at the left, and towards the end of the gospel today, uh, that we heard that Jesus went off to pray. And somebody in our CIA were up raise the very valid question of why did Jesus have to go and pray? If he is second person of the Trinity, if he is God, if he's one with God, why? Why? Why does he have to pray? I mean, when he goes and prays, what's he going to do? Get a mirror and say, hey, good to see you. <laughs> <laughs> but it reminds us that our God is Trinity. Father, Son, and Spirit. A communion of persons. And if then we have been created in that same likeness, the same image, and also, it's, it, that means that that is what we have been created for. And so in Jesus going off to pray, he highlights two different things for us. One, the way in which we are called to pray, and the necessity of how we are called to pray. That there were times in his life that he went out and he prayed uh, privately in those de deserted places. And then, of course, publicly, teaching, healing, forming the disciples. Which shows us that in our life that we are taught, that we are called to have moments of private and public prayer to model our lives on the life of Christ, but also then too to understand that we have been made for communion, we have been made for union, and so if we have been made for communion, that reminds us that any time that we elect to take ourselves outside the life of the church, that any time we elect to take ourselves and not be present to the living body of Christ. It raises the question for us, could it very well be that we are denying ourselves without even knowing it? Could we be denying ourselves without even knowing it? Denying the communion that we have been designed to share in. To know what it feels like to be part of this living, breathing body, the living body of Christ, the church whether it be in the church, in the encounter of sacraments, or even in our private prayer. And what we hear in Scripture today, the different uh, ways in which Jesus reaches out to us. Certainly, his voice is one that evokes power, the power to call, and the power to heal, and the power to do many great things. But for you and for me today, in order that we may have the fullness of life, the fullness of healing, the fullness and experience the fullness of joy of the Lent, especially the Lenten season that we are going to enter into. And we think about what is it that we need to bring to the Lord this week. May we ask ourselves and reflect. And as we look at all of our experiences in our life in the church, in our vocations, sacraments, what does Jesus feel like?
I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and hands visible. I believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only God and Son of God, born of the Father before all ages, God from God, life from life, true God from true God, to be God and not made, consubstantial with the Father. Through him all things are made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. And by the Holy Spirit was incarnate to the Virgin Mary and became man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried, and rose again on the third day in accordance with scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is adored and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. I believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. I confess one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. I look forward to the resurrection of the dead. In the life of the world to come. Amen. We place our trust in the Lord, presenting to him our prayers and interception. The response is, Lord, hear our prayer. For the church, that by preaching the gospel in word and deed, many may come to be saved. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For those called to leadership in the world, that they work diligently to raise people from slavery in all its forms. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For men and women who are living a consecrated life, for the gifts of fidelity and loving service, that they may give witness and inspire others to follow Jesus through a consecrated life. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For the infirm and those who have lost hope, that they be, may be comforted and strengthened by God's word. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For the members of this assembly, that we might be able to follow the Lord's example of finding quiet time away. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. That we may intercede for one another as we mention our many needs and intentions in the silence of our hearts. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For those who have died in Christ, especially for Lawrence and Aurelia Peck, whom we remember in a special way at this Mass, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. Lord, in your merciful love, we ask you to hear our prayers and to grant them according to your will. We ask all this through Christ our Lord. Amen. The second collection is Outreach Pantry. Our offertory hymn is number 672, Heal in Christ.
pray, brothers and sisters, that my sacrifice and yours may be acceptable to God the Almighty Father. May the Lord accept the sacrifice in your hands, for the praise and glory of his name, for our good and for all of his holy church. O Lord our God, who once established these created things to sustain us in our frailty, grant we pray that they may become for us now the sacrament of eternal life through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and just. It is truly right and just, our duty and our salvation, always and everywhere, to give you thanks, Lord. Holy Father, almighty and eternal God, for in you we live and move and have our being. And while in this body we not only experience the daily effects of your care, but even now possess the pledge of life eternal. For having received the first fruits of spirit, in whom you raised up Jesus from the dead, we hope for an everlasting share in the Paschal mystery. And so, with all the angels, we praise you as in joyful celebration we acclaim. Remember also our brothers and sisters who have fallen asleep in the hope of the resurrection and all who have died in your mercy. Welcome them into the light of your face. Have mercy on us all. We pray that with the blessed Virgin Mary, Mother of God, the blessed Joseph, her spouse, with the blessed apostles and all saints who have pleased you throughout the ages, we may merit to be co-heirs to eternal life and may praise and glorify you through your Son, Jesus Christ. Through him and with him and in him, O God, Almighty Father, 
in the unity of the Holy Spirit. All glory and honor is yours forever and ever. Communion hymn is Lord, I am not worthy. There should be an insert in your missile. <laughs> Holy 
Let us pray. O God, who have willed that we be partakers in the one bread and the one chalice, grant us, we pray, so to live that may one in Christ we may joyfully bear fruit for the salvation of the world. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. I can invite everyone to have a seat for a moment. It's part of Deacon Trey uh, and feel that we we don't want to toss them out when deacons are ordained or even priests are ordained, we don't want to toss them out in the world without having any experience. So uh, part of this is uh, allowing them to give uh, reflections um, and also to correlate to uh, the homilies. So uh, today is one of those days, and so Del is going to delight us with a few brief words uh, about our scriptures today. What does Jesus feel like? What does Jesus feel like? I know you have had a lot of time, but uh, hopefully you'll get to ponder that over the next few days. Psychologists and social workers are putting out alarms about the hazards of cell phone usage and our addiction to them. It's not unheard of for kids, teenagers, even adults to find themselves sitting across from each other at the kitchen table or at the lunch table, scrolling through their phones or text messaging each other when they're right in front of each other without having a simple conversation. The red flag about texting is it's instant and it's impersonal. Efficient? Yes. But this raises a question whether all life is simply about efficiency. The gospel this Sunday suggests otherwise. The gospel leads us to believe that Jesus' reputation as a miracle worker was spread. Everyone is looking for you, said Simon. Not surprisingly, they brought to Jesus all were ill or possessed by demons. In fact, the whole town was gathered at the door of Simon and Andrew's home. After witnessing or hearing about what transpired at the synagogue, earlier that day. The casting out of an unclean spirit by his mere words. Had efficiency been the point, Jesus could have simply healed everyone within 100 miles or even the whole world if he desired to. How efficient, how efficient that would have been. But surely something incredibly important would have been missing, the personal touch of Jesus. For Jesus, people are not just numbers, projects, or crops to be taken care of in an efficient manner. No. There's something incredibly personal about approaching the friend of a sick mother-in-law, or about friends bringing their sick son, they're bringing their sick to someone who promises hope and healing. This is the point of the gospel. Surely Jesus has the power to heal by word and by touch. But even more important, those healing accounts are instances, instances of the far-reaching power of Jesus to save. Jesus' healing offers a sign of salvation, and salvation is always up close and personal. Jesus' healing of Peter's mother-in-law was very personal. He approached her, he grabbed her hand, and helped her up. She was healed merely by his touch. The good news is that we too can be healed by the touch of Jesus. We are physically touched through the sacraments and blessings. We are anointed by oil by him in our baptism, confirmation, anointing of the sick, and perhaps even ordination. We absorb him when we celebrate and partake in Eucharist, as we just did. We join hands with him when we make our wedding vows to our spouse. And just yesterday, I'm sorry, and earlier today, Possibly even tonight, we celebrate St. Blaise and the Blessing of Pearls. In all these healings, and we'll be hearing more of them in Sundays to come, we receive glimpses of the greater mystery being revealed to Jesus, the mystery of salvation, the moment from death to life. By means of personal encounters with individuals and the healings, Jesus establishes a relationship 
with others so that he might preach the good news. The good news is that the kingdom of God is at hand. As his disciples, this is my work and your work as well. You must be up close and personal as Jesus was, as Peter's mother-in-law was and did. After the fever left her, she waited on him. She waited on him, not out of obedience, not out of love, or but out of love. Jesus' touch is transformative. His touch moves us to be a better person. So each time we encounter the touch of Jesus, whether it be through the sacraments or a blessing or the love of another, we too are transformed. Once, transform, once transformed, we are called to respond and act with compassion, mercy, and love. And God sees every act of that love as great. Today, do a small act of love for someone, put down the phone, and have a conversation. Maybe reach out to someone who's feeling like Job does in our first reading and be there for them. Open a door for someone, just say please, just say thank you. Believe, believe that however small it seems, it's great in the eyes of God. Most of us are not called to great deeds, but we can do all small things with great love. Few of us are in a position to help hundreds of others, but we can reach out and help those among us, a friend, a neighbor, a relative, a stranger, or a child. So reach out and touch someone today to find out what the love and the touch of Jesus feels like. Let's take the interest of home now. Please come forward. Let's take the other Christ of our mission, our prayers of all the others. Before we conclude today, just a few announcements. Um, first of which is, uh, please look at your bulletin this weekend. There, I hate, I apologize that we took out like a forest with all the publications this weekend, but uh, Lent is about a week and a half away. And uh, so there's a complete Lent and Holy Week schedule with all the events that are going to be taking place throughout our parish, as well as scripture reflections, my pastor's letter, all that stuff. So please uh, look through all that information. Also, coming up on Saturday, February 17th, we'll be having our parish uh, Lenten retreat from 10 to 2, uh, 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. at the Lodi site, entitled Into the Desert. I'll uh, be focusing on fasting, on prayer, and Lenten suffering. Jake and I will be giving that. Uh, that retreat, and then also on uh, March 7th, we kick off an 11 week uh, Bible study on the Psalms. And so, those registration forms and uh, information can be found in the gathering area. And also, last call for articles for the parish newsletter, The Harvester, those are due in uh, tomorrow, or I mean Monday. Um, and uh, it'll cover everything uh, from the spring and through the summer. And uh, last but not least, next weekend we'll be having a social here in Litchfield. Uh, there will be a Mardi Gras social. And uh, so if you come here to the Vigil Mass, we're going to have uh, pierogies. But if you come on Sunday, you get punch keys. So however you want to eat your way through the parish next weekend, <laughs> um, be my guest. So anyway. And then we're going to conclude tonight uh, with uh, uh, Mass with the blessing of the rose. I'm just going to give a general one for everybody as we conclude today. So let's please stand. <clears throat> the Lord be with you. And with you, your spirit. To the intercession of St. Blaise, Bishop and Martyr, may God deliver you from every disease of the throat and every other illness. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in the peace of Christ. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Our closing hymn is number 383, Take the Word of God with You. Mm -hmm.